Hey everybody, um, welcome to our first uh, virtual lab walkthrough. This should be interesting, um, something I haven't tried before, so I'm experimenting. Hopefully it's not terrible, and uh, also hopefully it gives you a little review of experimental procedures involved in studying kinetics. So without further ado, I'm going to walk you guys through um, a set of PowerPoint slides. I'm also going to jump back and forth in between a whiteboard um, from time to time. And wherever you guys see a bright green um, prompt to stop and think or stop and do, I want you to pause the video and go ahead and take that time to do what I've asked you to do in that prompt. Um, and you can respond on the companion worksheet provided for this lab. So here we go. Some background information. It'll be like story time. I'll read to you. What factors determine how fast a chemical reaction will occur? The answer has applications in chemistry, food science, geology, and even art and architecture. Consider the weathering of beautiful marble statues from antiquity. I'll show you some that my mom and I got to see just recently when we were in Italy. The history of our civilization is gradually being eroded as acid in the environment dissolves the calcium carbonate in marble. In this virtual lab, you will investigate the rate of decomposition of calcium carbonate with different concentrations of hydrochloric acid to learn more about kinetics and the rates of chemical reactions. Calcium carbonate is one of the most abundant minerals on Earth. More than 4% of the Earth's crust is composed of calcium carbonate. It's a major component in limestone, marble, seashells, and bedrock. Limestone and marble have been among the most widely used building materials for more than 5,000 years. In many places, limestone is also the foundation of our Earth in both bedrock and mountain ranges. The gradual dissolution of marble and limestone monuments, as well as coral and seashell structures, is due to the acid-base neutralization reaction between calcium carbonate and the increasing amounts of acid in precipitation and ocean water due to anthropogenic climate change. The word anthropogenic means caused by humans. Um, when you guys are taking you know, marine biology, some of you have taken that course or you, you work at the aquarium or you're interested in, in that kind of thing, ocean acidification is having a massive impact on the structure of coral reefs and on the ability of mollusks to protect themselves with their calcium carbonate shells. Because the reaction that we are going to take a look at in this lab is a reaction between calcium carbonate and any, not just, hydrochloric acid. Um, and that reaction causes the decomposition of that um, ionic solid. And so that's obviously a problem if that ionic solid is your exoskeleton, if you will. I hope that's the right term. It's probably not. Don't tell Mr. Lavasser. Anyway, um, to bring it, you know, sort of to a personal level, you guys know that I just got back from a trip to Italy with my mom. And no, Justin, we did not get coronavirus when we were there. Um, where we had a chance to see Michelangelo's most famous statue of David. Um, and had Michelangelo's David not been moved in 1873 from outside, where it was originally placed, in Florence's Palazzo Vecchio, into the protected halls of the Galleria dell'Accademia, who knows what condition it would be in today. Here's a video of my mom and I walking past Michelangelo's unfinished Pieta and up to the breathtaking David himself. If you're interested in art and art history, I have um, fallen in love with this new journalist that I found. He's not new. He's been around for a while. Um, a New York Times journalist by the name of Sam Anderson. And he wrote an award-winning piece um, on Michelangelo's David, which just brings in into um, 
well, it's just a beautiful article that uh, that plays in, in science as well as the humanities and art and culture and what it's like to, you know, grow up and find yourself. So if that sounds appealing to you, go ahead and click on that link down below um, where you can find out more about that article or just read the thing in its entirety. Okay, so back to the chemistry of this lab. The products of the neutralization reaction between calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid are calcium chloride and carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is unstable, we've talked about this a lot, decomposing to give carbon dioxide gas and water. In fact, I probably should have had a green stop and think here or a green stop and do prompt. Um, not a bad idea to stop now and write these reactions down so you can really clearly see what's going on. This first reaction being a double replacement reaction that produces calcium chloride and here's your carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then automatically at room temperature and pressure decomposes into carbon dioxide gas and water. So our overall reaction down here below, the rate of the overall reaction and its dependence on the concentration of hydrochloric acid are important concerns in environmental chemistry due to the effects of acid rain and ocean acidification. So, you know, you guys can clearly see here that in the presence of any sort of an acid, the solid calcium carbonate is going to essentially dissolve and no longer be a statue or no longer be a mollusk shell. It will become aqueous calcium chloride, which is soluble, water, and carbon dioxide. So we want to know how fast does that reaction take place and why? At what concentrations or how, how much do the concentrations of the acid really matter? Kinetics is the study of rates of reactions. As reactants are transformed into products in a chemical reaction, the amount of reactants will decrease and the amount of products will increase. The rate of a reaction can be determined by measuring changes in the amounts of reactants or products as a function of time. In other words, we can look at how fast the reactants are disappearing as well as how fast the products are appearing. So here's where I'd like you guys to stop and think. Look at the reaction below, and I want you to look at each species in the reaction, and I want you to actually think about if you were to go into the lab, what sorts of things could you use in order to measure this reaction's reaction rate? So for example, let's take a look at each individual species. Calcium carbonate is a white solid. HCl is an aqueous, strong acid. Calcium chloride is a colorless solution. Water is a colorless liquid. And carbon dioxide is a gas. So stop and think, pause the video, and write down some ways that you think that you could measure reaction rate. Welcome back. Did any of you say that you could measure the mass lost over time? Because if we look at this reaction, you guys, as the calcium carbonate reacts, we are producing carbon dioxide gas. And so that carbon that was present in that solid is going to be leaving the reaction vessel as a gas. And so this reaction is going to lose mass over time because we are not capturing that gas being produced. So you could in fact measure mass loss over time as a measure of reaction rate. Perhaps you said that you would measure pH change over time. If hydrochloric acid is one of your reactants and as that reaction proceeds, it gets neutralized and forms water, the pH is going to rise over time. You could measure pH change over time and convert that to concentration of acid. Maybe you thought you could use a colorimeter to measure the production of calcium chloride in solution. Now, maybe you didn't say that because I said that the solution was colorless. You would need a colored solution in order to measure changes in concentration using a colorimeter. However, that is something that we did use in the crystal violet kinetics lab. So I do want you to recognize that you can use colorimeters to relate to concentration and measure concentration change over time. 
But in this case, that would not be the best tool because the calcium chloride solution is colorless. And then perhaps your last option would be to collect the gas produced. So we could measure change in volume of CO2 produced. We could collect CO2 over water and measure volume of gas produced over time. We could also um, collect the gas in a container that does not change volume, in a rigid-sided container, and instead measure the increase in pressure over time. Okay, so what are we going to do in this lab? or pretend to do in this virtual lab. In this lab, we decided to collect the carbon dioxide gas produced over water, and we will measure the rate as a function of volume of CO2 produced over time. So we're gonna measure in milliliters per second, or milliliters per minute. It would depend on how fast this gas is really being produced. You can adjust those units depending on um, your respective volume and time increments. So let's take a look at just a reminder of how we, in fact, would set up collecting a gas over water. So watch as the instructor first fills the gas collection device, in this case his syringe, with water. He's obviously covering that with, looks like a piece of glass. <laughs> Hope he doesn't cut himself. Just to make sure that there are no air bubbles as he inverts this cylinder into a pan of water. And you can also see that that syringe is capped at the top. Submerge that syringe in water. Remove his little glass square that he's using and he's going to insert some rubber tubing. Now this rubber tubing is connecting to some glass tubing and a one hole stopper that he is going to plug the reaction vessel being the test tube with. So here's the rubber tubing that he's gonna insert up into the gas collection device. If I had really been thinking ahead, you guys, I would have brought home all of this stuff and done this for you. And in goes the calcium carbonate into the hydrochloric acid, which he plugs with the one-hole stopper and the tubing. And you'll see that carbon dioxide being collected in that syringe, and the water is being pushed out the bottom. So collecting a, collecting a gas over water. And then we can measure rate. We can measure volume of CO2 produced per unit of time. It's a good thing there's so much good stuff out there on the internet that I can steal from. Okay, so here's another stop and thank you guys. When did you do a procedure similar to this? And what was the name of the gas collection device that we used? We did not use a stoppered syringe. We used something else. So pause the video, think about where you've seen something like this before, and see if you remember what that equipment is called. Did you remember that it was the molar volume of a gas lab? Where we did a reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid, and we collected the hydrogen gas produced in a udiometer. So that long, skinny gas collection, sort of like upside down graduated cylinder looking thing, is called a udiometer and is the most common tool that we use to collect gases over water. Okay, so another stop and think for you because now we're gonna review some other stuff in the middle of this lab. If you guys don't nail those lab response questions on the AP exam, I'm gonna be real mad at myself. All right, stop and think. Can you write out that reaction, the reaction of magnesium and hydrochloric acid, as a complete molecular equation? And then I want you to assign oxidation numbers and identify how it is also a redox reaction. I want you to write out those two redox half reactions and the overall net ionic equation. Go ahead and pause and do that. Is this what your reactions look like? 
So the overall reaction, the molecular equation, showing the magnesium single replacement reaction with hydrochloric acid to make magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. This was the hydrogen gas that we collected and um, did some gas laws equations with to calculate that the molar volume was in fact 22.4 liters per mole if we were at STP. And then if you were to assign oxidation numbers, your magnesium is an element in its standard state, so it has an oxidation number of zero. But here in the magnesium chloride compound, the magnesium has a charge of a plus two, or an oxidation number of a plus two, a charge of a two plus. We invert the signs for those things. So your oxidation half reaction is the magnesium losing those two valence electrons. And what's happening with the hydrogen in the acid is the hydrogen has a one plus charge here in the acid, but is neutral, has no oxidation number, has an oxidation number of zero as an element in its standard state, which means that these two hydrogen ions were each gaining an electron apiece to become H2 gas. And so that, of course, is our reduction half reaction. And the oxidation number for chlorine didn't change at all. It was a minus one both on the left and on the right, making chlorine a spectator ion. And so we can cancel the chlorine out and our net ionic equation appears down below. Okay, but none of that had anything to do with the lab at hand. I just wanted to do a little bit more review, but I'm done. Okay, so recall back, we're looking at calcium carbonate, you know, the, the important mineral in these beautiful marble statues and incredible buildings um, that were built from ancient times and still stand today. This calcium carbonate reacts with acid. And so the purpose of this lab is twofold. First, we will measure the initial reaction rate as a volume of CO2 produced over time. So we're just gonna measure initial rate with six molar hydrochloric acid and a chunk of calcium carbonate. How fast does that reaction start out? In addition to measuring initial rate, we will also determine the rate law for this reaction with respect to the hydrochloric acid. There are many factors that affect reaction rate, right? Remember the four important factors, concentration, temperature, the nature of the reactants, and catalysts. And we can quantify the specific relationship of concentration to rate with the rate law and the reaction order. So if a reaction is zero order, that means that concentration does not affect the rate. If a reaction is first order, it does affect the rate. Same with second order. We will determine this reaction order and rate law by comparing the initial reaction rates using various different concentrations of acids. So remember, there's two ways to determine the rate law. You can do multiple different experiments with different initial concentrations and measure those effects on initial rate. That's what we're going to do. There is another method of determining the rate law, which would be doing just one experiment and letting it run over time, carefully measuring the changes in concentration over time or changes in you know, pressure of gas produced over time. There's lots of different ways you could do it. And then making those three different graphs where we graph concentration versus time, LN of concentration versus time, and one over concentration versus time, and figuring out which one is linear. That is not the method that we are using in this lab. So in this lab, we are looking at initial rate and multiple experiments with different initial concentrations and seeing how those different initial concentrations affect the initial rate. Okay, stop and think. What would the generic rate law look like with respect to the HCl? Like what is a rate law? What does a differential rate law look like? Use a variable to represent the unknown reaction order. Is this what you wrote? I hope so. Very good. So the rate on the left in this case is going to be measured in milliliters per second because we're going to be measuring volume of CO2 produced over time. And the rate constant times the concentration of the HCl raised to whatever respective order we happen to find. 
Okay, so into the lab itself. Our first goal is to measure the initial reaction rate. So imagine we're in the lab and we initiate the experiment with 0.5 grams of calcium carbonate and 10 milliliters of six molar hydrochloric acid. The volume of CO2 produced was measured at one minute intervals. And here is the data that you guys found. So I want you to pause here, and I want you to use this data to create a graph of volume of CO2 produced versus time. Hopefully your graph looks like this. Okay, now another time for you to pause and work. What we want is to measure the initial reaction rate. And we can clearly see here that the initial rate is pretty fast and then it seems as if the production slows down over time. So in order to measure the initial rate as opposed to an average rate, we want to draw a tangent line at that you know one minute mark, at that first point. And we want to take the slope of that tangent line. That's how we get an instantaneous rate. So go ahead and pause and on your graph, draw a tangent line at that one minute mark and calculate the slope of the tangent. That will be your instantaneous rate at the start of the reaction. I decided to have Excel do the work for me. Um, I just reduced that graph to the first three points and added a trend line. And when I add that trend line to that graph, I get the equation for that line, and it's y equals mx plus b, and the slope of that line being 22. Now yours might be a little bit off from that, depending on how you drew your tangent line, how big you drew it, where you decided to you know, end your triangle but it hopefully is somewhere around there. So the initial rate of this reaction produced 22 milliliters of CO2 per minute. Okay, so we've done part one of the lab. We've calculated an initial rate of reaction with six molar hydrochloric acid. But if what we want to do as well is to determine the reaction order, we need to run this experiment a couple more times at different concentrations of HCl and see how that affects the reaction rate. And so that's what we did here. Now that we determined the initial reaction rate using six molar hydrochloric acid, we can see how much a change in concentration affects that initial rate and determine the rate law. So, Based on the data you obtained in that first experiment, that graph that you're seeing up on the right, or you're looking at your own graph, do you expect concentration to have an effect on rate, or do you believe the reaction order to be zero? And why do you think that? So go ahead and pause and respond to that prompt. Is this reaction zero order, or should we further investigate to see if it is first order or second order? Oh, I didn't put an answer on the next slide. I guess I need to go back. All right, I'm gonna go back and answer it here. If we look at this graph, okay, so the answer to this question, and you guys are gonna sort of check yourselves as you work through um, the companion worksheet. We see that this reaction rate slows down over time, right? The change in volume of CO2 produced gets smaller as the reaction proceeds. So if the reaction is slowing down over time, we know that concentration of the HCl is in fact affecting the rate. As the HCl gets used up, less and less CO2 gets produced. So the reaction is slowing down, which means that it is not zero order. So it is first order or second order based on the fact that this graph is not linear. So we need to test, we need to do some more tests. We need to use different concentrations of HCl in here. So the first one we did was with six molar. Let's do it again with four molar and two molar and three molar and one molar. Let's do a couple other iterations 
and see how the slope of this initial rate changes. Based on that, we will be able to determine the rate law. So we repeat the experiment. We do it again with four molar and three molar and two molar HCl. And we did the same exact thing where we drew a tangent line along that first um, point, data point, and we found the slope of the tangent in order to find the initial rate. So you can see experiment number one is the one that we already did together. And then I would like you guys to imagine that we do it again for experiments two, three, and four with gradually reducing the concentration of HCl. Using this data above, I want you to determine the rate law and the reaction order with respect to the hydrochloric acid. Let's go ahead and pause the video here. And because I am unable to actually write on these Google Slides, um, I'm gonna actually pull up a whiteboard here. So, Let's do that. Let's pull up our smooth draw. A little bit annoying that I couldn't draw on the Google Slides. You can do it on PowerPoint, but of course I made this in Google Slides, and then when I tried to convert it, it didn't work so well, blah, blah, blah. You guys don't care about my problems. All right, here's what we need to do. We need to look at how a change in concentration affected the initial rate. So let's take a look at experiment one and experiment three. In experiment one, where we have six molar, oh great, are you kidding me? In the middle of a long ass video recording, oops, excuse my language, my smooth draw goes all wonky. No, I don't wanna save that. Yeah, I thought my videos were gonna be all super slick by now. There's clearly some work still to be done, you guys. All right, so let's look at experiment one where we have six molar HCl and an, an initial rate of 22 milliliters per minute. And let's compare that to experiment three where we have three molar HCl and a rate of 11. Do you guys see how when we double the concentration, we doubled the rate? Right? So if when we double the concentration, we double the rate, we would expect that to be first order. Let's double check. Let's look at experiment two, where we used four molar HCl and got a rate of 15 milliliters per minute versus experiment number four, where we used two molar HCl and got a rate of seven milliliters per minute. So again, we're multiplying by two and we are seeing approximately a multiplication by two again. You know, it's not exact, but obviously we've got some experimental error in there. Okay, so these two sets of data can confirm for us that we are in fact seeing a first order reaction. So the rate law that you guys should have gotten, if you paused, I know it was a little confusing because I was like flipping to the next slide and then going back to my whiteboard. Your rate law should read rate equals K H C L. If you wanna raise it to the first because that makes you feel better, totally fine. This reaction is a first order reaction. Okay, back to our slides. All right, lastly, in conclusion, I want you guys to do two more things. Number one, ooh, I probably gave you the answer to this in the background. What is another method that you could have used to determine the rate law? So describe another method that could have gotten us to the rate law for this reaction with respect to the HCl. And then a totally separate question with a totally separate reaction. Another lab was conducted with a 0 0.03 gram sample of magnesium reacting completely with excess hydrochloric acid. Ah, like we did in the molar volume of a gas lab. 
I see I'm tying it all together. This time though, we do this reaction at a bunch of different temperatures because not only do we care about how concentration affects rate, we also care about how temperature affects rate. So we run this reaction at a bunch of different temperatures and the data below was obtained. I would like you to first write a statement simply explaining how did temperature affect the reaction rate? Like, did it have an effect? And if so, what was that effect? And then I want you to use the Arrhenius equation to determine the activation energy of this reaction. Do you remember how to do that? We went over it in our unit review. Go ahead and pause and answer those two questions. Okay, so final answers. If we repeat the experiment one more time with any molarity of hydrochloric acid, and if we were to measure, again, you could stick with measuring production of CO2 over time. You could measure mass lost over time. Um, I wanted to highlight another thing that we could measure for this reaction, um, which would be the pH change over time. And so if we measured the pH change in short increments until the reaction is complete, so just one experiment, let it run to completion, we could take that pH value and convert it to a concentration of hydrochloric acid, and we could create three distinct graphs, a graph of the concentration of HCl over time, the LN of HCl over time, and one over the HCl versus time. And whichever graph is the most linear will tell us if the reaction is zero order, first order, or second order. So that would have been a different way to determine the rate law without running multiple different experiments. And our final answer. As temperature increased in the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid reaction, so we did it at a bunch of different temperatures from 463 Kelvin to 524 Kelvin. As the temperature increased, so did the rate constant. The rate constant got bigger, and thus the reaction rate was faster at higher temperatures. We can take this data, and if we integrate the Arrhenius equation and we graph the natural log of the rate constant, versus one over temperature, we will get a slope that is equal to negative EA over R. In other words, we can use that slope to calculate the activation energy of this reaction. So here's where I'm gonna to have to go back to my whiteboard. Let's do that calculation together. Or maybe you already did it. If you already did it, Fantastic. Okay, so I know based on this equation that my slope is negative one, nine, two, one, zero. And that is equal to negative EA, my activation energy, over R. Now this is my energy R, my 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so all I need to do is multiply my negative uh, 19,210 times my 8.314 and my activation energy is Oh, you would think I would have my calculator handy. Sorry, you guys. 19,210 times 8.314. My negatives will cancel. One hundred and fifty nine thousand seven hundred and twelve. And that is in joules. So I'm gonna need to turn my joules into kilojoules, right? Because it's in joules here. So divide by a thousand makes my life a little bit easier. 160 kilojoules per mole. This is the activation energy for this reaction.
And I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. Oh, if you guys were worried about the Kelvin canceling, remember your x-axis is one over temperature. So really this unit here on our slope is Kelvin. Sorry about that. And so your Kelvins will cancel this Kelvin and that Kel that Kelvin will cancel. I neglected to show all of my units properly. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we can use reaction rates to help us determine activation energies of different reactions. We run the same reaction at multiple temperatures, measure the rates, and graph it. Okay, well, that didn't feel totally like a lab or at all like a lab, but I think it's the best I can do for now. <laughs> If you guys have any other ideas um, about how to better take a look at a set of lab data, like if you would rather just read it in a Word document and analyze it that way, as opposed to walking through it slide by slide with me, um, I'm happy to do it that way as well. But I think it is worth our time to look at how we would experimentally determine some of these concepts that we've been talking about in our review sessions, because I'm quite certain that the FRQ on the AP exam will be lab based. So good job. Thanks for hanging with me and I'll see you guys next week.